Welcome, everybody. Hopefully, we have fixed the feed problems that we have been suffering from for the last several weeks. Welcome to Mr. Dan Pancaldi. Hey, Artie. How are you? I'm doing okay. So we are going to talk about that period, which comes after medieval and after uh, before Napoleonics and what we call it. If indeed it does not have multiple names, which maybe it does. I That's presume. very interesting that uh, we're doing this topic there already because I'm uh, I'm putting together the CSRs and um, serendipity or synchronicity, whatever you want to call it. Well, I've been thinking about this for a while because I'm uh, an enormous uh, dork and keep a spreadsheet of all my stuff. And I don't have a lot of titles that exist in this kind of space, right, before Napoleonic. But, you know, the Napoleonic period, which I say starts with the French Revolution in 1792 or whatever it is, um, rather than with Napoleon per se. But it definitely ends by about 1815, right? And then you've got a, a bit of a oddball era too that it's kind of between you know the end of the napoleonic era and the start of world war one well hold in on that the era, Napole it would, what, what about the american civil war where do you put well, it in right there? so there's a bunch of important conflicts in there like the american civil war and the franco-prussian war and the spanish-american war um that we tip sometimes the american civil war especially because there's a lot of games about it um uh, we tend to kind of break that off into its own category, but it kind of pops up right in the middle, right, of between 1815 and, and 1914. So, you know, how do we how do we categorize these things? And tonight I want to focus on the, the post-medieval um, pre-Napoleonic period, and then maybe we can talk about the other one later. I'm stuck on the period between World War One and World War II, the interwar period for categorization purposes, which is not incredibly helpful. S to some extent, this probably has some bearing on awards categories, but it, but not really. Well, per well, se. it helps. It helps in categorizing and fine tuning. Sure, that the question is going to get to be is is how many games come out in this category in this you know in this call it when so when does the medieval period end? Right, the, the Napoleonic period. I've already said somewhat arbitrarily that I say it starts in 1792. Um. So when does the medieval period end, right? I'm going to say, I mean, and there's a bunch of like historiographical dates that people throw out. Uh, one example is, I think, 1422. Is it 1422 when Constantinople is taken by the Turks? Something like that. Mm. Um, that's as good a date as any. Um, there's also the... Um, the Wars of the League of Cambrai, which uh, I don't recall the exact dates on at this moment, but that's the first set of wars in which battles start to be decided by the presence of gunpowder. Um, 1492 is another one that some people throw out as, hey, the New World is discovered, plus the end of the Reconquista in Spain. Um, so I'd say, you know, it, that that figure is going to be around 1400 or 15, uh, 1500. Um, there's definitely gunpowder before the end of the medieval period, uh, but it, it doesn't get to be decisive until around the time of the War of the League of Cambrai. Well, do you want to do you want to uh, look, you'd be helping me out a whole lot if we go. Actually, you'd start from ancients and we start deciphering or do you want to focus on napoleonic well we could start with periodization too i mean uh so i mean i uh, but you know different people will tell you different things and war, a war gamer might give you a different answer than a historian might so for example what do we consider and there's the additional variable of the the categories are all different depending on where you are in the world right um, we consider Great Battles of History to be an Ancients series, but there are two Japanese games in the series, one of which is not that old, um, which takes place, I think, in the 14 or 1500s. So, you know, that's a, a what I what we would consider a medieval period uh, that's covered by an Ancients series of games. So, so I consider Ancients to be, I guess there's a prehistoric period too, but there's not a lot of games in the caveman genre. Well, there was there was a um uh ubisoft game uh the far cry they did they did the uh, prehistoric i don't know if you they ever did? played that game no i never played any of it yeah with spears and, and their saber tooth tiger and, and stuff okay that's sounds like it might be interesting i have no i don't know i know there's a role-playing uh, at least two role-playing games that i can think of or 
products anyway that were set in you know the, you the pre uh historic era which you we said call role playing uh, i was contacted by noble knight and they're having a role rpg sale so Noble was, Knight's having an RPG sale. No enemies 10 to get, what is it, 10% off? Is it no enemies Yeah, 10? no, but I'm saying that because I think you would be interested in something like that. Uh, I got enough stuff. I'm good. I've okay. spent a lot of money okay. in the last month. I'm good. I'm, I made the choice to not buy something on the cons on the Facebook marketplace today. So I just got my four-game package from Revolution Games. So we'll be seeing unboxing videos of those. Uh, they're all Ziploc bags, so they didn't cost me four games from Revolution Games and Ziplocs is a very affordable four four game set. But yeah. still, I don't. I've spent enough. I'm I'm good. I, what I, was the I've shipping spent, on that? Oh, like ten, oh, uh, maybe fifteen classic. bucks, something like that. I don't know. I forget. But it wasn't you know for four games. I'm very happy with the shipping cost. Hey, Steve Hethwell, Mike, uh, Jeff, uh, Carl, uh, Lead Magnet, Doug. You know, and they shipped uh, FedEx too, not uh, not USPS, who has already cow. lost the package I just bought off the uh, off the BGG marketplace, which mm. we'll get to see hopefully when it shows up. So anyway, um, so ancients period. Uh, we start what? with ancient, unless we want to say prehistoric. Uh, we start with ancients, and that goes pretty much from the dawn of recorded history to when we started to writing stuff down. To where? where? To well, that depends, right? Um, one might say, uh, his, the histor historical, the community of historians has moved away from the term dark ages for quite a while now. Instead, they tend hey, to Trevor. call it late antiquity. Um, I say this period ends in 800 AD on Christmas Day. What happened then? The coronation of Charlemagne. Hmm, okay. So, I say that that is the, the end of the ancient period and the start of the medieval period. It, it, the ancient period explicitly including late antiquity, which does include uh, some but not all like Byzantine topics and things like that. So if you're making, if you're creating an awards like the Charles S. Roberts and one game comes out in between, one game comes out in the, uh, in the ancients, Mm -hmm. what, 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 what's your, where do you fit it in? What, it wins? Well, I mean, that's a challenge, right? That is a thing that has to be decided. Do you decide that you're not going to have an Ancients category that year because there's only one or two games released in that category and there's not enough of a field to pick from and then fold it presumably into a different category? I think you do... I, I think it is desirable but not mandatory to have the same... to have a stable list of categories... But maybe you don't have to do that. Look, um, Artie, look what Jeff Beeler is saying about China's Middle Ages. China's Starts Middle Ages can start with the founding of the Ming Dynasty uh, in 1368 to 1644, following the collapse of the Mongol-led Yuan Dynasty. Hilariously, here's how I know this date. You'll all know how I know this date. Um, June 6th, 1644 is the date of the fall of the Ming Dynasty. Um, so guess why that's memorable? Why? Because it's the same, it's 400 years to the day before D-Day. Oh, sorry. So, or 300 years. So, um, but yeah, so you could say that, yeah. But, you know, the, the history does not necessarily map completely between East Asian history and what we consider, West, or African history for that matter, or New World history necessarily, and what we consider Western history, right? Um, so you you, you got to bear in mind, and none of that's to say you don't fit it somewhere, but you, you got to make decisions of where you're going to put that, right? Um, in in some respects, in that period, China was more advanced than anybody else on the planet. So, so, so and how do we say it's medieval just because they had a sort of a medieval-esque form of government? I mean, because they really didn't, actually. They had a uh, well-developed bureaucracy well before that period. So, so why don't we just go by date? So from date... <clears throat> I'm going to say from date zero to 800 AD, these are the games. From 800 AD to this, sure. these are the games. But then you're going to run into other problems. So where do you put table battles, for example, which has a simulation of a variety, not really simulation, but a game about a variety of battles from all kinds of different periods, from you know battles that Alexander the Great fought in to battles that George Washington fought in. How do you categorize that product? 
Or do you have another category that says non-period specific war games? I mean, it's these are these are challenging questions. Uh, that's it's really confusing. I'm tired. So, Doug, of course, and I could talk about this for a while. Um, you could you could call the fall of Rome. Uh, you could pin that on any number of different dates. Four fifty five, I think, is for four four fifty four. Something like that is one of them. Uh, that's one of the of several sacks of Rome that Didn't occurred. Didn't they go in this, up to eight hundred Rome? Well, the I mean, the the, the city's still there. No, no, I'm talking about but the, the Western Empire. Roman Empire. The last Western Roman Empire is deposed at some point in the fifth century. And one of the Italian kings actually takes the regalia and ship has them shipped to the emperor of the East in, in Constantinople and said, we recognize with a letter that basically says, we recognize your authority. We do not need an emperor over here. We're good. And that, that held fine until Justinian went and screwed it all up and stamped out a very stable Visigothic kingdom in, in Italy. Anyway, so uh, I know something about that period. I know very little about the but the the um, post medieval to pre Napoleonic period. Well, I was so anyway, say, you got ancient. Where does, where does the medieval where does the medieval finish now? Well, again, I think you say something like fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred is a nice round number. I think the wars of the League of Cambrai start in the late fourteens or early fifteens. So so we can say fifteen hundred, right? And that's when you, you know most uh, people will say that we're we're in the Renaissance at that point. These periods don't necessarily necessarily map to medieval Renaissance, but then then Renaissance it can be subdivided into any number of periods, including an age of reason and an age of exploration and an age of uh, this and that. It, it gets it gets hard and arbitrary to make those distinctions. This is absolutely true. Uh, at no point did the Byzantines call themselves Byzantines. At no point did they call their empire the Byzantine Empire. They called themselves Romans and they called their state the Roman Empire up until they get overrun in 1450, whatever. So that, that is absolutely true. They're, they called their state Romania, even though they mostly spoke Greek for everyday business. They still, you know, named things in Latin, at least some things. <laughs> so this yeah. seems a bit arbitrary as well but you know but that's that is kind of the point it's that it's up to us to make these decisions and how do you how do you make these decisions i guess that the the the, the lesson i suppose is to just clearly communicate those expectations right especially if you're running an awards show hypothetically um that you want to be able to say hey this category of medievals is you know, 800 to 1500 and stuff that happens in that period is falls into this particular category. If, if you are categorizing by time period and you don't have to, there's nothing that says you have to, that's how it's traditionally been done. And I certainly have enough cells in the spreadsheet reflecting a period and a, and a more specific period and a more specific before that. I think I'm up to, I think tier five topic where we have say world war two Pacific theater um central pacific campaign so jesus and and that's a pain in the ass well yeah because like i said if one game comes out in the central pacific theater well it wins right well i'm trying to th i'm trying i'm actually i've actually been trying to think about it from a database building perspective because i'm thinking about building an actual database as opposed to actually just working out of a spreadsheet but you're right you're already you're right about when you talk about world war ii man there's three categories there, really. There's the Pacific, Western, and Eastern. Mm -hmm. And if you're starting to think about it in terms of volume of games that comes out in any particular year, I mean, you could almost say the East Front is worth its own category. Right? I, I, I would think so. Not 50 saying, games every year so. come out about the East Front, right? So there's plenty to pick from. Um, you know, Battle of the Bulge. There's reliably a couple of games about the Battle of the Bulge get released every single year. Yeah, but you can't make a category just for the Battle of the Bulge. Or can you? Says who? I mean, is that a useful category for awards purposes? No, I don't believe that it is. Not unless your awards are the Battle of the Bulge War Game Awards. And so, uh, and so, how would you present an awards like CSR? Do you say this is our opinion on time? Well, so if if I were running it, 
okay, I would first of all have less categories than than the current awards have. Um, I think the the number of categories is very large and is somewhat unwieldy, particularly for an on all volunteer team that is put upon to to make stuff happen on a on a schedule, right? So I would first of all pair that um, pair that uh, list of categories way back. But you know that's you know not my call. No, no, I I understand. No, you're now just... in terms of like the games categories, I mean. I think if you're going to categorize by chronological period, which as Led Bagnet points out, there's no, nothing that says you have to. Um, maybe you should categorize by mechanic, but then you start getting into, you know, how, how do you define Euro mechanic? Bloody this is hell. a Euro game. This is, first, this is a war game, and we're back to that same goddamn topic that we keep arguing about every single month. Yeah. So... Um, which is, you know, which we we have never arrived at a consensus on and that, and, never and we're never will. going to. So... If you're going to categorize by period, then I think you know, and and what we're talking about is a war games period rather than a history period, where, where maybe it doesn't make sense to say you this period is World War II. But I think honestly, you you could strip it down to games that happened before World War II, games that happened during World War II, and games that happened after World War II. That from it from the from the sense of the the selection of games that are released each year that those three categories actually kind of make sense. Well, I mean, now that you put that thing of World War II in my head, having three having three d distinct categories: East, West, and Pacific. Oh, it's more than that, right? You got the Mediterranean theater. You have the Atlantic. There's a Battle of the Atlantic. I've got games about the Battle of the Atlantic. Where do you categorize those? It's not just the Pacific. And then you have, hey, here's a game about the, the whole Pacific War, or Empire of the Sun, versus here's a game about the invasion of Tinian. Okay, well, I mean, there's not really a big similarity here. One is primarily a big naval game that covers many, many months of time, uh, men, you know, in a single turn. Uh, the other is a game about the invasion of this really tiny island that turns her two hours, right? So there's there's... The, they're they're in the same part of the world and in the same time period, but in terms of design and and maybe evaluation, they don't have much in common. So this is this is a problem. This wasn't really my intention to tackle this subject from this angle, by the way. But now that we're talking about it, yeah, it's, no, good, I mean, uh, it's a good yeah. question. It's a good discussion that maybe we ought to have, especially if somebody in the audience is running an awards show, hypothetically, right? So, well, I mean, I, I, I'm interested in this because I'm doing the, I'm presenting the awards, right? Right. And I mean, any, any uh, criticism is, is awesome. I, I, it just makes it better. And now, now well, I, I, I hope that, that the criticisms that, that, that the many, many criticisms that I have levied against the, this process for the last couple of years are being taken the spirit in, taken in the spirit of me trying to be helpful rather than well, me being a dick. Of course. Um, I, I know that at least to some extent, I have in fact come off as a dick, ah, uh, which is not my intention, but you know, sometimes, sometimes I can't help it. So, so, I mean, do you have an early and a late gunpowder period? May, yeah, I think you have to actually. Have I mean, to? there's a huge difference between, um, so uh, American Civil War is a great example, and it's an, actually an interesting period in, in a non americentric way, because the American Civil War during that period in America is when we saw the first introduction of machine guns, at least in the modern sense, right? There were actually repeating firearms before that, but um, but we started to see machine guns. The Gatling gun was was designed during the U.S. Civil War, and the Army didn't really use it very much. Uh, but the but they put it on gunboats and stuff like that. And it's of course a manual system, right? It's not like a fully automatic machine gun like we would what we would consider now, where the recoil uh, energy of the rounds uh, provides the mechanical action to keep working the gun. Uh, that's what we consider a machine gun nowadays. Uh, that's a huge change, right? Um, I mean, gun, that, that's arguably just as big a change as the initial introduction of gunpowder small arms back in the, 50, you know, 1500s so or, or late 1400s, as the case may be. 
Um, this is reasonable. I think this is reasonable, but from a war games perspective, I'm not sure those categories are you are that useful. Um, but you know, we'd have to actually conduct an analysis of of games released in any given period, which which is something that you could do, especially if you had access to the BGG database, which nobody nobody publicly does. You cannot publicly troll that like query that database directly. That would be amazingly handy. You know, Doug Doug's uh, Doug's um, uh, statement here is not. But without... Doug's not Doug's not wrong here. The, no, the, this, not, these I are mean, three to... meaningful subdivisions of that period. Yeah, but how do you Based... how do you categorize? How do you make a how do you make a section like that for <clears throat> for a war game thing when maybe one pike and socket uh, a musket and pike game came out? Oh, I got better. I I beat you Th that. Look at uh, so America again. You know American Civil War, and I only mention this because I happen to know um, where there's a huge variety of different forms of armaments present sometimes in a single battle. Um, you had uh, you know yeah. men on the field at Gettysburg with Sharps repeater rifles and men with old muzzle loading muskets um so you know even in a, the same the set literally on the same three-day period on the same battlefield you had uh, a almost quantum leap in um weapons technology available right there so so this gets to be complicated right you know but if you the 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 moral of the story is always it's complicated oh it's more complicated than than it would than it is easy so yeah this is true too this is true too i mean and as somebody uh some other uh this was volko actually i'm trying to remember his exact context he pointed out a, a natural dividing period of that post-medieval period as the treaty of westphalia which ended the 30 years war which uh kind of the 30 years war is a nasty piece of business okay basically everybody says it's about jesus so we're, we're all going to kill each other about it um, so Nothing's everybody's changed. killed each other, Ma massacres, you know, Germany by some, the reckoning of some did not recover until the 1800s by the reckoning of some others. It still has not recovered. Um, so big messy war after the treaty of Westphalia warfare kind of returns to a more limited format for a while. Um, so until depends who you talk to and exactly how they're going to draw the distinction, but at least until, um, Napoleon and or World War One. So, so what happens after World War One? We got World War Two. Well, we got a, a period between World War One and World War Two. So, what but happens I there? What happened? there is a there is a a continuity, but and some historians have made this case where there's really only one big world war, and there happens to be a break in the middle. That's what I um, think, and I think. I, I don't know that I'm convinced of that, but I think a good case can be made for mm -hmm. that um, in that there is definitely a continuity between sort of the, you know, and, and for that matter, a continuity between the end of the American Civil War, where you saw a lot of the same stuff that you did in, in World War One, where you saw these entrenched units using heavy firepower to repel attack attacks after attacks. Um of course, World War One on the West Front, anyway. On the East Front and in the Mediterranean, it's a little different. But on the West Front, the whole war bogs up like that until the the advent of new tactics and like the Sch the Schutztruppen and stuff like that, and new technology like tanks. Gas was an effort to break that stalemate, which did not break that stalemate. For example, gas was not decisive in World War One in any sense, in any strategic sense, on the tactical sense, in the tactical way it was sometimes. So okay, I mean, in between World War One and World War Two, did, did did anything of major importance happen in terms of? Well, the Czechs thought so, right? I don't know when they got invaded in 1938. So yeah, the tons of stuff got well. All, oh, also, yeah, the Manchuria thing with the, with the with the Japanese. That's well, that's true too. That's that's so. I often, if I stop to think about it for any length of time, will say that World War II starts in 1937 with the Second Sino-Japanese War. But right. you could also push that back to the original invasion of Manchuria in what 1932 or 1933. So then you've got like this. We, we just you know white people just didn't care at right, the right, time. Right. 
Um, yes, very good. Because uh, until that point, it was not seriously uh, undermining Western economic interests in the region. That like Carl says that uh, between World War One and Two, the Soviets invaded Poland. I was about to mention. There's the Russo-Polish War. There's also uh, that's it. That's before World War One. But uh, there's the Russo-Polish War. They fight a significant conflict. Uh, there's the Russian Civil War, which is an amazingly complex topic, and which everybody got involved at some point, including the Americans. Um, the the American sent troops. The Ru the French sent. I was about to say the Russian sent troops. Yeah. Obviously, um, the, no kidding. The uh, the British sent troops, the French sent troops, American sent troops. So so tons. I'm not sure if the Germans did or not, but they probably did. So how do you categorize that then? Russo inter interwar period is what I call it. Well, I think so they, it's T one interwar period, T two Russo Polish war, Bloody or hell. Soviet Polish war. Uh, here's another one. This is another invasion, Italian uh, invasion of Ethiopia, which happens before 1939. That's in what, 36? Yeah. 1936. Uh, um, and in which the Italians get tied down for quite a while and fight, <laughs> fight, the, fight the Ethiopians. So uh, it's, you know, a very significant conflict for the Ethiopians. God, that guy was and an not idiot. Just for the Ethiopians either. That's uh that's an important part of the world in ways that a lot of a lot of people that were raised in the American educational system do not realize. So yeah, this is very difficult, extremely difficult. It is, it, it is, it's it's a challenging topic. And at some point, if you're gonna like use this for something, you've got to make and, and not just talk about it. Um, you've got to make decisions about, you know, hey, I'm we're doing gonna do this, you know, the 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 Danny Awards. How are we going to categorize our categories, right? You gotta make start making decisions if you're gonna pick chronological subjects. But if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, have categories that break down over non period uh, periodic lines, you're gonna have different questions that aren't necessarily easier. Um, somebody suggested using mechanics to to categorize games, which I agree is valuable. Um and and would be interesting to talk about but but then where do you draw those lines and we have to think about okay so do we get all the way into the weeds of this is a chip pull game or this is a better example this is a card driven game but this is a card driven game with or without ops points um this is a card driven game with or without events this is a card driven game where you're just suit matching i mean you can have all of those things yeah but are we nitpicking is that nitpicking now what's that is that nitpicking Absolutely it is. But where do you stop? It's all nitpicking. That's the point. So where, where do we go from World War II? We go, what, Korea? Um, I, I would say there is a post-war period or Cold War period. So this again, this is how I do it, right? I say there is a Cold War period that runs from 1945 to 1990. Uh, coinciding more or less with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and that period includes things like the Cold the, War itself, the, the, the Korean uh, War, the Korean War, um, something like uh, Victory Games Central America, would, which is somewhat hypothetical, but it's it's still in a Cold War context. So I'd put it in there. All this all this Cold War hypothetical stuff, you maybe put that in there, although I categorize all that stuff as hypothetical stuff rather than as Cold War stuff. Because I draw a distinction. Some people don't want to draw this distinction and they get very uncomfortable when I say games, war games about topics that didn't happen are their own category. That's well, just, yeah. you know, that's just my opinion. Yeah. No, I understand that. Yes. Now, so, uh, so you said Cold War period, okay? Mm -hmm. So from 45 to whatever, 1990, let's say there. Yeah, I'd say 1990. Okay. Would you, would you, uh, what about the Nicaraguan period? Uh, uh, affair that the, the states were in with Is that them. when Reagan was selling them weapons and stuff. Yeah, uh, that's in the eighties, so that's co that's in the period. That would be Cold War. That's in Cold War. Yeah, and it's a proxy. You know, it's to some extent anyway. It's a proxy war. Yeah, as yeah, is Vietnam fine. and Korea. So Viet Korea stops being a proxy war at some point when the Americans start directly fighting the Chinese. But yeah, then it's then it's just a war war. Absolutely. Um, but the the Vietnam War. You know, was as we all probably know that are watching this channel, uh, was never a declared war. It was always a policing action. Um, they, they, there was never a war declaration there on the part of the U.S. Vietnam. Um, yeah, we just never declared war. It was never a declared war. Um, now that didn't fool anybody, right? 
No, no, right? but you're freaking me out here. I never heard of that in my life. Oh yeah. Well, if you that's because you you have you you didn't you're not in America, I guess. <laughs> we care a lot about the Vietnam War no, in I the U.S. But to never... the extent that for a lot of years it was a taboo topic for war games. People didn't want to touch it. Relatively few games came out on the Vietnam War. Oh, I'm gonna have to uh, research that. Uh, that it was never declared a war. That is correct. So the Johnson never said the Vietnam War. Oh, I'm not saying the president or some official never said that. There was everybody called it the war. Right, it right. It just wasn't a declared war. There was no, oh, you know. So the way it's supposed to work is Congress has the power to declare a war. Um, that did not occur in the case of the Vietnam War. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay. So where do we go after from 1990, man? What do we? I call, call that the modern period, and that covers uh, everything from like the Gulf War, uh, which there's games on, uh, war in Afghanistan, all that stuff. War on terror is part of that period. So you wouldn't call the Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, co uh, civil war? Uh, you would call that a Cold War? I'd call that a modern war because that kind of happens after the 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 dissolution of Yugoslavia, right? Right, but we're talking about okay. So it happened after 1990. Okay, you're right. Uh, what the exact timing looks like on that exact period, but I think you do have to retain some abil some ability to be a little bit flexible. Uh, for diff to reflect different realities in different parts of the world at, at any given exact moment. And what? Okay, so modern. Where does modern end? Because modern does end. Modern ends uh, at seven o two p.m. Eastern Daylight Time today. Would you? Well, okay. Look, uh, the war in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. You'd call that modern? Would you call that advanced? I don't know that I'd call any topic, uh, any of these topics advanced. So because, I, man, I, I, everything's changed. There were stealth bombers. There now, was you could, flight. well, yeah, but that's true. The stealth, stealth bombers were, uh, were, were, were there a reality in the 90s, I think. Um, they were around for quite a while before before you started seeing them in movies and stuff. Um Bucklitz War is another one, but that that I believe that falls in the Cold War period as well. Uh, but it, that happens to not be a proxy war in particular. It's a, just war because the the Argentinians got uppity and the British decided to assert themselves. Yes, and um, I would have done the same thing. Well, regardless of you know, I have no no I don't know enough about the Falklands War not being British uh, to have any meaningful thing to say about it. Well, so, if something somebody comes into my house, what are you doing in my house? Get out. Well, right. And the people that lived on the islands, which wasn't nobody, all wanted to continue to be part of the UK. Yeah. And not part of Argentina. So And when when was the when was the Falklands or or, or the Malvinas taken away from Argentina? Oh, I don't know the exact timing on this. Oh, I thought this, you know this, looks, this looks like a job for Wikipedia. <laughs> because because the only reason the Argentinians uh, went in is because it must have belonged to them a while ago. Well, it, it, they had it, there was a contested claim from that that had been existing prior to that conflict, and I think the Argentinians had not had nominal possession of the islands at one point. And the but the fact is that they went in because they thought they could get away with it. Yeah, they no, thought stupid, that the British stupid. were not going to. This is not to necessarily justify any British decision, but the, the Argentinians would not have done that had they known they were going to have to fight a war over those islands. Really? Because there's nothing on those islands that's worth fighting a war over. No, it's just rocks. So, right. There's some people but and rocks, and that's like it. And some lichen. And that was a that was pretty brutal war, man. It was very brief. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they sank some ships. There were a decent number of fatalities. I don't want to say decent, but there were a, a, a number of fatalities. I mean, it was not a bloodless conflict. No, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat too, man. So... There was some Argentinian soldier that was killed by a crumpet. That's funny. I'm I'm totally making that up. <laughs> really? I'm totally making that up. <laughs> oh my god! Is it a crumpet or an English muffin? In in England, it's a crumpet. In 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 the U.S., it's an English muffin. Canada, I'm not sure about. 
Well, I think we have crumpets and English muffins. Crumpets have holes in it, and English muffins don't. English muffins have holes in them. To my eye, I, you can get crumpets in the store down here, and they're called crumpets, but they look just like English muffins to me. Well, so those were the Queen's Rocks. Yeah, that's very interesting so, and very, very complicated. and Much uh, less effective weapon than a New York-style bagel, however, I got to say. Hold on. A New York-style bagel, Artie, is a wannabe of a Montreal bagel. I don't care what I you say. I don't know about that. Oh, don't start it. I don't know anything. About, I've never had a Montreal-style bagel. I have well, had a New York-style bagel, and it's like chewing on a cinder block. Okay, no. You, you, so look, um, I don't if know. If it's a soft and fluffy bagel, however, it is not a proper bagel. If it's soft I'm, and fluffy, I'm gonna say bagels should not be. They should be dense and chewy. Yeah, no, rather they're, than they're soft chewy. and fluffy. Like no, no, no fluffy. fluffiness, no fluffiness. You gotta, you, you gotta come to Montreal and try the, um, because we have a Hasidic uh, uh, ghetto, for lack of a better word here. And I swear to God, they're, they're got to be the best bagels in the world. And it's been said. I would assume that it is. They, I, I mean, I would assume that the that you know that that I, I've heard good things about Montreal style bagels. Yeah, okay? right. And it is well known that the Jews make the best bagels. Yeah, you're so for I don't sure. believe I'm inviting any controversy and saying no, no, no. I can't have bagels anymore. Did I mention that? Why? I'm on a, I'm on a diet. Ah, I want bagels. Come bagels. on. So anyway, Pop, poppy seed or uh, or sesame seed. I like the everything bagels actually, or or the the ones that are just salted, or if you could find them, salt and, car and caraway seeds. Ah, come! You're bastardizing the whole thing, man. That, there's a there's a uh, Buffalo, New York, and or you know, like Western upstate New York thing called a Weck roll, which is basically a Kaiser roll covered in salt and and caraway seeds and it's awesome that sounds good though yeah it's awesome yeah and you you absolutely flatly cannot get them here in ohio at least not that i've ever seen so we're off topic now oh jesus yes <laughs> so you wanted to talk about what the napoleonic um section of, of of categorization yeah because i think you know you could quibble about the exact start and end dates but i think you know i think we we all have a rough agreement on them you know this is medieval or this is napoleonic even if napoleon himself is not in charge of anything yet um like i said i start the napoleonic period with the french revolution around 1792 uh, but between there, there's clearly some evolution that happens and where do you draw the in, in you know from a military historiography standpoint, how, where do you draw the lines are, is the question. And then what do you call those periods? Doug had some uh, some suggestions up thread a bit, but those are those are terrible titles. They're descriptive, but you can't call it the you know the socketed bayonet era, right? <laughs> that's a that's a terrible title. It's not like the you know the 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 ancient wars period right you, it's the socketed bayonet era just does not have it's not punchy you know what i'm saying sounds like, a, sounds like a condom to me there you go so i'm not sure what's up with the japanese mayo i i don't know how it's different from regular mayo if it's, it's just it, there's like something about it it's more it's i don't know it's 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 more beigey and it comes in a QP doll kind of thing, and it's yeah. I see it on the cooking squishy. channels all the time. I don't know. Maybe there's some uh, 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 tofu something. I mean, in it. you can get like regular man American mayonnaise in a squeeze bottle. That's not that in itself is not. That's true. The, that's uh, true. That's true. That's true. So at least nowadays you can. But I mean, I don't know. I I, I don't know what's up. Yeah, it's tangy. That's that's it. It's more like a um, the fish thing. What do you call it? Uh, when you have when you make fish, you make oh, you tartar make sauce, tartar sauce, yeah, yeah. So, this is a really oddball <laughs> choice of where to put that period, that defining period, though, because this is you know, seven years' war, right? Adolphus gets killed, I think, during the seven years' war. Most people are gonna put the dividing feature of that war, uh, with Frederick the Great rather than Gustavus Adolphus, but I don't see any reason why one's better than the other. Um, so that's very interesting that patchwork pictures has mentioned gustavus adolphus who as is well established 
did not speak Latin. So why do we call him Gustavus Adolphus? 30 years war. 30 years war was hu a, a, a huge part of the reason why Germany did not unify as a country until the 1800s. Why it took the Italians less time to unify as a country than it did the Germans. The, 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 the roots of that are in the 30 years war and its causes. You know what? We should have had Ben Hall on, man. This guy knows. Sure. Actually, that'd been a great idea. You should have had Ben Hall on. Bloody hell. We could have talked to him about this. And he's involved in the whole Musk and Pike series and uh, and uh, the it's whatever that other series from GMT is coming that Spanish All Their Fears, uh, which is, I think, War of the Spanish Succession or Nine Years War or something like that. I forget. I, I, had, I, I had this over and I didn't look it up. So. It's it's one of those seventeen hundreds or sixteen hundreds period uh, wars. I can ask him for next week, and we can uh, go deeper into whatever. Sure, it's your your show next week. But it's not my show, Artie. It's our show. Yeah, but it's on your channel next week. Not for God's sake, man. So the difference between mayo and aioli is aioli has garlic in it. It's also right. actually a different. If you make it properly, it, aioli is actually a different. Type yeah, of it's, it's more liquidy. Yeah, well, it's actually not done. It's not whipped. It's like um, it's it's done in a mortar and pestle. It yeah, and and, you know and has garlic in it. I'll tell you something. We did we did pesto in a in a um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, we call that the uh, culinator there. Uh, the food processor. The food processor. Thank you. And we did we did the, uh, a pesto with a mortar and pestle. Mm -hmm. 100% different. I'm given to understand that. However, my border, my mortar and pestle is really tiny, and I'm not making friggin' pesto in it. So, is that what your wife says? <laughs> oh, <boy>. Zing! <laughs> Most of the time, if you go to a restaurant and get something that has aioli on it, what they have is mayonnaise with garlic in it. Yeah. So, yeah, no. So, you're really only going to notice the difference if you make it yourself. All this stuff's on YouTube, man. So, I have so I have like my personal channel of like not gaming stuff, although gaming stuff sometimes creeps into it. Where I subscribe to like science videos and cooking videos and Absolutely. crazy dude out in the woods making a shelter in minus fifty weather. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know whatever whatever loony stuff I want to watch that's not gaming related goes to that channel. And I but I watch a lot of food stuff. You ever so. watch the Mortician Woman? No, no, really. No, I guess not. You should. Uh, okay. What I'm telling just, you. What do I just Google mortician woman? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I forget what her channel is, but I know uh, uh, Devin Heinel, the, uh, the OG, watches that too. Yeah, she's a mortician. You can literally, predictive search actually comes up with this. And what's her name? Uh, I don't know what her name is, but but the channel is Ask a Mortician. Yes, that's her. Okay, so yeah, I don't really need to see that. I watch it. Yeah, yeah, it's stuff. cool. So yeah, yeah. Um, How do sometimes I'll, I'll get started watching somebody like hand make a guitar or something like that, and I'll just sit there and watch it for an hour. Fascinated. Don't you want to know how a fat person decomposes compared to a skinny person? I'm good. There's a whole bunch of stuff I don't need to know. And what about in a crematorium? Does a fat person burn brighter than a than a? You know what I'm saying? These are the important questions, I guess, <laughs> to some creep. Yeah, Caitlin but, Doherty, uh, uh, Doherty. That that's it. William, William Burns. Well, the 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 the. I, I mean, they don't. That doesn't happen at the, the. The cremation doesn't happen at the at the funeral home. It happens at the crematorium, right? Yeah, but still. I mean, I I don't. I honestly have never looked. Even though I I am getting letters at this point about making my final arrangements. Uh, I am not really? at all interested in this topic. Yeah, <laughs> really? Have you considered your final arrangements? No, I haven't gotten that yet. So, so anyway, yeah. There's, there's a the cooking channel. There's, um, hold on a second. The Dragon actual Man. like cooking channel on cable TV sucks compared yeah. to just watching whatever you want on YouTube. You ever see two fat, uh, two fat ladies or something? Oh, I remember them. They're oh, fantastic. They've been off the air for a long time, as far yeah, as I know. Yeah, because they're dead. 
that well that does surprise did you see the food they were eating that horrible know, British know. food that was like <laughs> and and now we'll pour a quarter ton of lard into everything I loved it man lard makes it delicious as you know so that says art restoration you know what Doug I'm gonna check it out well, so I mean, I watched some of that too, actually. And that that can be interesting. But yeah, when they did the Sistine Chapel, oh, you're gonna mess with that now. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully, they won't get that person that ruined the whatever mural that was, wherever that was. I forget what the details were of that. I assume Doug is referring to competent art restoration and not childish idiots doing art restoration. So, Artie, is someone? Yeah. What are some good games? Uh, Thirty Years War, man. It's actually a tough topic to to find games on. There's a lot of battle games. You could get battle games in the. Uh, I want to say, uh, if you look up some of the battles, you'll see games on the individual battles. On the whole war, uh, there's a game called Holy Roman Empire, which is a Mark McLaughlin game from One Small Step, which I have seen and I wanted at one point, and now it's impossible to get. There is also a game called 30 Years War Europe in Agony, which is a GMT point-to-point card-driven game on the same system that powers uh, uh, the Paz Napoleonic War. Wars and, and Paths of Glory and a, a pile of other GMT point-to-point card-driven games. Uh, that's probably what I would run down if I was if I had immediate interest in that topic. No. Uh, and wanted something that covered the whole war as opposed to individual battles. Artie, uh, excuse my ignorance now. I, I know nothing of the Thirty Years' War. Uh, who were the belligerents, and was there actual battles for 30 bloody years? Oh, yeah, there, there totally was. So 1548 or 1650, I think it's 1548. Um, mostly Germans. The, 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 the war was primarily fought on territory that is now parts of Germany. Uh, but, but the French, a lot of other groups got involved. Um, the, you know, the Austrians got involved because they're part of the Holy Roman Empire, obviously. Um, the, I think the Russians got involved at some point. Uh, the French were definitely involved. And the British, of course, are always okay. meddling on the continent, especially when they can send somebody else's troops in to get killed. So everybody oh. gets involved to some extent, but, it, but primarily World War II, man. it's, yeah, well, yeah, at World War I too. Uh, <laughs> primarily it's a war between Germans, uh, German Protestants and German Catholics. That involved all of Europe. No, it pretty much just Germany, but but uh, other powers jumped into it here and there. Uh, Tony's talking about the Battles of the Age of Reason series, which is a branch of La Bataille, but cleaner. I'm happy to report, and that may cover some of the period as well. I know that BAR covers like American Revolution and Seven Years War stuff. I'm not sure if it covers um, Thirty Years War or not. So, yeah, these were, like I said, these were messy, right? Protestants versus Catholics is like the the primary European source of conflict over the last several hundred years, for for about the last three or four hundred years. And it makes me, so, think, it makes me think of something, Artie, in terms uh, World of... World War One and World War II aside. <clears throat> well, it makes me, in terms of categorization, where do you categorize the Brits killing the Irish, the Irish in the 70s? Where's that? That's not in Cold the 70s, War. 70s, I mean... In That's terms of the war. periods that we've talked about, you call that Cold War, but it's got it's another one of those things that's got nothing to do with the actual Cold War between that's the right. US and the Soviet Union. It's just a side con like the like the Falklands War, that's a side conflict that happens to happen in that period. And therefore, that makes you think that maybe Cold War is not the best name for that period, right? Maybe well, maybe post war is the best name for that period. And but then you got to say post which war, right? Post and, the and Korean post War. You know, the, the guy that fought in the Korean War thinks that's the big war. The guy that fought in World War II thinks that was the big war, right? So which war are you talking about? And where do you stop post, uh, uh, post-World post War II? Where do you stop that? Well, I, I still think you stop it in 1990 or so. Why, Mike Anthony said- mentions a mighty fortress, which is kind of an inspiration for Here I Stand, which blunt... Well, so... I think there's general agreement that a mighty fortress, while cool and and loaded with potential, does not actually work. Um, here I stand at least actually works at least part of the time. Here I stand. If, if you're interested in in like the 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 genesis of the religious conflicts, by the way, 
that I do recommend. Here I stand. It's sequel uh, Virgin Queen and it's upcoming prequel Tanto Manta, which is on P500 right now, which is not a great title because nobody knows what that means. Um, but they're all good games. Here I Stand is is very tricky to play because you really want six people, and it really kind of does take six or eight hours. So, <laughs> so you only I only get to play it once every several years when the massive engineering project of arranging a game of Here I Stand gets completed. So, and it's it's like with six people, it's really cool. <clears throat> but two issues with that: one, it's not nearly as cool with five or four people. It's okay again with three. With two people, there's a two-player variant that I've never played, and as a as a solitaire game, it's not very good. Um, the other thing is that even with six people, it is not equally fun for all six-player positions. At least not for me. I think the the playing the papacy or the Protestants is really engaging. I think playing the English is fairly interesting. I think playing the French or Austrians is dull as actual dishwater. Um and I have no idea what you would do if you're playing the Turks. Um, Virgin Queen's a little more forgiving in all of these respects. By so, the way, uh, Doug, uh, I stand corrected or I sit corrected with the uh, the Brits and the, uh, and the Irish. Thank you. I am not even getting into that. <laughs> no, I know, but I'm just saying everybody's so, got a side, eh? I mean... I mean, there's two sides to a story. What that? Yeah. So the the Hollenspiel has that horse and muskets. Is that what it's called? Horse and musket. Horse and pike and musket. No, it's horse and musket. Horse and musket. Which which is a there's like 250 battles available in that series. It's crazy if you have all the stuff. There's a lot of stuff. A lot of content for that thing. So and they've just like revamped it all with where they got bigger boxes and it's, it's really quite nice now. Age of Renaissance. Age of yeah. Renaissance is a good game, but like a lot of Avalon Hill games um, of that and earlier periods, it takes longer to play than it really ought to. Um, History of the World is like that. Civilization is like that. Civilization should be a three to four, two to four hour game. It's a six to ten hour game instead. Um, those those games are are slower than they ought to be. This might be true. The spread of, of who's interesting in a mighty fortress, which is basically the same setup as here I stand, um, where you've got the six big powers and it's, you know, it's the wars of religion. Um, the, the spread of who's interesting and who's not might well be different in those games. And this is a six player game. Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, I think a mighty fortress is too. And a mighty fortress is another one of those really innovative SPI things that really didn't quite come together because they never play tested anything. I'm exaggerating slightly, but but it was not sufficiently play tested. Definitely, uh, <laughs> there's definitely <laughs> excitement when you start talking about people with the Habsburg jaw. Yeah. So, anyway, Taiping Rebellion. Hold on, do I have that handy? Yes. Game about the Taiping Rebellion, available now from GMT. You can get this from GMT. I, I don't know if GMT's that. version has the English rules. This did not, but you can get the English rules on the BGG page, too. Uh, this is a Richard Berg design. It's a, it's based on his earlier Taiping Rebellion game. The Taiping Rebellion, in no sense can I sum that up. <laughs> it's it's There's a lot of weird stuff. It is a uniquely Chinese event. It was real bloody. Um, Christian missionaries are involved and then a weird Chinese sect that I, I'm, I call them weird, but they, you know, they, they weren't weird to them, um, uh, emerges and tries to kick foreigners out. It's, it's got, you know, the predecessor to the, the boxer rebellion and a bunch of other stuff. Fascinating topic. Almost no games from the West on this topic. How Only difficult? Richard Berg would do a game. How on difficult this. is that game? Uh, this I have no idea. It doesn't look that complicated. I mean, it's super comp. It's super difficult actually because it's all in Chinese. So, so that makes it therefore extremely complicated because you got to learn Chinese to play it. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, there are English rules on the on BGG. So, so hopefully it's playable. Right. Or it's and not what? like G seventy five dollars on it otherwise. GMT is distributing that. GMD does have copies. Yeah. Okay. I just noticed that, like, like in the last week. So, ah, uh, yeah, let's mention that uh, since we haven't, I mentioned it on my Monday stream, MMP is having a sale starting at midnight Eastern on Friday. Um, MMP's typical sales, nobody knows what will be included in this yet, is a limited selection of their products. 
with discounts that range from good to absolutely bananas. Seriously. So, yes. Like, like 70 or 80 percent off in some cases. So worth your time to check out whatever what, MMP what is. This has already? When is it? Starts at midnight Eastern on Friday. And it's just their sale. They're just, yeah. it's, that's what it so is. So they're doing a Halloween sale instead of a Black Friday sale because they plan to be shipping um, a, an ASL product around Black Friday. So they don't imagine that they can get both things done. Oh, uh, yeah. I remember last year's sale. You could get a game for like 15 bucks. I bought, I, I'm not sure if it was the last sale or the sale before that, but I bought um, Operation Mercury, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think MSRP on that is like 160 or 180 I got it for $40. That's insane. So I'm like, hey, I got one already, but for $40, I'll take another one. I wouldn't do that now <laughs> because I spent too much money, but I might end up ordering something from them just on the basis of... Uh, I, so I'm in a similar position with MMP than I am with GMT, where... Almost everything that they actually have, I are that I want, I already already have. So um, the only thing I could think of is the ASL Korea module. Well, you I know, really what, Artie, if if you got if you got the time, oh, please. it wasn't quite this cheap, but it was it was pretty cheap. Hey, you want a huge D Day game and you like SCS? I mean, it's a huge D Day game, and they will probably have it on sale. There you go. Look, uh, can you suggest again? Please email me. Write some tactical. The tactical games that they have, if they're on sale, I'll pick them up. The tactical game. What? It, what? Yeah. It, so the you TCS. can handle ASL starter kit, for example. I got it. Okay. You think um, they have like? Do, you, do you, I got the? I can't see it right now, but they have a. Uh, uh, fuck! I can't speak anymore. Uh, they have ASL one, ASL two, where they introduce. Uh, artillery air cell three where yeah that's the starter kit stuff right do they yeah. have those on sale sometimes i don't know probably not is my guess because because they 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 like print them and a month later they're gone yeah. <laughs> every time so there's not really much incentive for them to put that stuff on sale but some asl stuff will go on sale like the action packs and things like that they will they invariably have those at pretty good sales I but if you're not like fully invested in asl don't be buying that stuff Starter kits, it's all its own thing. So uh, the ideal BCS entry point is going to be Ericor, which is on their pre-order system right now. So that won't be on sale. Um, SCS, any of the SCS games are light, easy to play games. Uh, Rostov 41, I think, would be a good starter SCS game. Um, uh, Panzer Battles, I, I'll be honest, Panzer Battles is not that small. Uh, and I tried it and didn't like it. I tried, I thought it was trying a little too hard to, to have SCS play like OCS, and I don't think that quite worked. Uh, Angola, highly recommended by tons and tons of people. Thanks, board game bloke, for mentioning another MMP game that I don't own and that I probably should buy if it comes up for that good a sale. I, it is supposed to be a really good game, it is a multiplayer game, so bear that in mind. And it's one of those stabby 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 games that dan might not like too so <laughs> any of the tcs stuff but i don't know what they have in stock for tcs either so I'm other than ariete which is a like a ziploc tcs game it's an ideal uh starting point for tcs but uh a you got to be interested in like italians in north africa which dan might be yeah i'm um, interested and B, it's TCS, so it's not the simplest system in the world, but neither is it. It's no ASL either, right? So, and that's, a, as I recall, a platoon level tactical system. They got Canadian, Cru oh, Canadian Crucible. There is one called the Canadian Crucible, which I think is Canadians just after D Day in inside the, the doing some stuff in the, the Normandy Lodgement, I think. Uh, I agree with this. Uh, Front Towards Enemy is a Vietnam tactical game designed by uh, Joe, Joe Chacon. Joe, yep. And it's supposed to, it's, it's well regarded. Uh, great campaigns of the American Civil War. This is another one of those things that might not go on sale, but if it does, it's not a bad idea to get in on it, especially since those the sticker prices on some of those are pretty high. My highest recommendation in that series right now goes to uh, Roads to Gettysburg 2 because I think there's a huge amount of value in that box. But it's an expensive box. But if you can get it on discount, do that. 
Uh, the same thing, though, applies to Stonewall Jackson's way, too. That's also got a lot of value in the box. That looks like one of the ASL starter kits, eh? What, this? Yeah. South no. Mountain. That's the So that is the last game in the Regimental Sub-Series, which kind of was kind of on its way to be in line of battle at that point. So it's a Regimental-level Civil War. Uh, it's not the biggest battle in the Civil War by a lot, but stolen from the library of Carl Paradise. Um, but uh, it's it's not the smallest either. And and not an entry-level game, I, I don't think. Well, and nevertheless, if you're interested in South Mountain specifically, then it's, a, it's supposed to be a good game, right? So there we go. Carl from Board Game Bootcamp is going to play On to Richmond on saturday on the richmond is one of those campaigns this is uh the seven days campaign or the peninsula campaign the virginia peninsula in this case where uh which is where robert e lee first rose to prominence prior to that campaign he was called granny lee for his advanced age and propensity to not do anything um and then in a pretty brilliant campaign called the seven days campaign or seven days battles um, he pushed McClellan's much larger army back, uh, and basically blunted that entire, uh, you know, would be war ending campaign of McClellan's. Um, you know and that is an ideal campaign to show off the strengths of the great campaigns, of the American civil war system, I think. Oh, we could eat. I mean, I could talk about, I could literally have a show maybe next week, little <laughs> Mac and the Pinkertons and how they kept telling him. He was outnumbered by six to one by the by the Confederates, <laughs> even though the Confederates were out of manpower. So, Arty, man. It, all right, I'm, we're over time, and I have uh, we our uh, our Halloween is tomorrow, so I, I got like stuff to do. So we're gonna call it a night. What are you doing for Halloween? We got to give out candy to the to the, the young children that walk. Ah, by. so, but that's tomorrow. A lot of kids come to your place? About 200 kids a year. Oh, Jesus. What does that set you back? Uh, uh, usually about 50, 80 bucks, something Oh, like that's that. not so bad. But still, yeah. you get a couple yeah. of games. That what I need to get is, is a is a bulk deal on like those little toothpaste tubes so I can give those out next year. Ah. Or maybe those, those tiny bottles of mouthwash. <laughs> that's what I'm looking oh, for. Oh, God. For that's horrible. Year. My wife will kill me. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. And now all we're right. wrecking stuff. All right, everybody have a great night. Thanks, people. We will see you all next week at Dan's place. Ciao, Artie.